In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The title of my sermon is Discovering the Gospel of Your Life. And throughout, I will be posing a number of open-ended questions, each of which you might consider an invitation to an intentional exploration today of your life and your faith, which you can always do on your own, or if you like, as I mentioned before the service, you could take part in one of two offerings this fall through the Diocesan School for Christian Faith and Leadership, one designed for congregations and one is a self-guided, individualized online course called Explore. And I make this invitation well aware that amid all that your life demands of you, how busy you are, the challenges you face, the enormity of suffering we experience and see every day, and it's been a particularly devastating week, hasn't it? That Such endeavors as personal faith exploration can seem like a luxury you simply don't have time for. And if that's true for you, I understand. Yet these questions, these questions of faith and self-awareness, while while not always urgent, keep coming back. For they are the questions, as the poet David White suggests, that have no right to go away, for they have to do with the person we are about to become. They are the conversations that will happen with or without our conscious participation. In fact, they're happening right now. These are the questions that inform and sustain us through life and how we respond to the world around us. They determine what kind of person we will wake up to be tomorrow. Let me clarify what I mean by discovering the gospel of your life, word by word, starting with the first, discover. When we discover something, it's helpful to remember that nothing has changed in the material world. What changes is our awareness, our awareness of something whose existence had been there all along, And in most cases, what we discover, others have known about for a long time, which is a common observation among the people whose ancestors were here in the Americas centuries, if not millennia, before Europeans discovered what was for them a new world. And in our personal lives, what we might discover about ourselves is generally not news to those around us, which is why The work of increasing self-awareness always involves asking others to tell us what they see in us that we cannot. One of my favorite examples of this is an exchange between two characters of a movie that came out about 20 years ago entitled The Legend of Bagger Vance. Matt Damon plays Ranulf Juna. He's a professional golfer in the early 20th century who's attempting to make a comeback after his life hit rock bottom as a result of what he experienced in the trenches of World War I. And Will Smith plays Bagger Vance, who's this mysterious man who shows up and befriends Juna when he was all but lost to alcohol and despair and slowly helps him heal while serving as his golf caddy and coach. And in one scene, June is playing in an important golf tournament, and he is way off his game. And at one point, he turns to Bagger Vance and says, well, you know, this is getting embarrassing. To which Bagger Vance replies, oh, no, sir. It's been embarrassing for some time now. And it's good for all of us to have a truth teller like that in our lives, sometimes. And especially when the truth is hard to hear. 
And while what we discover about ourselves is sometimes embarrassing or, or even shameful, at other times, the discovery is unexpectedly affirming of the good in us that we can't see or that we tend to minimize. And when others name that goodness, it can feel like a revelation to us, a new discovery. Conversely, and this is important, one of the easiest ways that we can bless the people around us is simply to take the time to point out the goodness we see in them. For they may not see it or allow themselves to accept and live more deeply from that good part of who they are. And how much better the world would be if more of us lived boldly from that place. So my first question, what do you suppose that others see in you that you don't see or that you tend to downplay? And what might change as a result of you knowing and accepting that part that as yet you don't know is there? Now, there's a lot of energy being expended in our country right now and in many of our churches, attempting to better understand certain aspects of our history and specifically the roots of persistent, pervasive racial inequities in our society. And there's an equal amount of energy being expended actively trying not to know these things and certainly not to teach them to our children. And there are implications for us as individuals and as a society, and implications about what we choose to know or not know about who we are and where we come from. But this process of discovery only affects our awareness of what's true for us. The truth exists whether we choose to know it or not. So now let's skip over to consider the last two words of the sermon's title, your life. Your life. And the parts I'd like you to focus on are these. First, the arc of your life of your life story and where you see yourself now on that arc. And second, the recurring patterns and stories that help you interpret your life. And lastly, the aspects of your life that you cherish the most, what you love about being you. So starting with the arc. Picture in your mind's eye that image that shows up when you're on an airplane, you know, that tells you where you are in relation to your destination. And imagine that as representing your life and where you might put yourself on that arc in any given part of your life. Are you just at the beginning or are you in the middle, coming near the end? Having some sense of that puts a lot of other things into perspective. Years ago, after dropping off one of our, college, uh, one of our sons off at college in um, Chicago, I gave a slightly older son of a colleague a ride back from Madison, Wisconsin to Minneapolis, which is about a four-hour drive, so we had time to talk. I asked him a bit about his life. He had graduated from college a few years earlier, and admittedly, he was struggling, as is common for many in young adulthood, with loneliness and vocational drift. And at one point he said, a bit tongue in cheek, I think I'm having my quarter life crisis. And he expected me as someone nearly twice his age to smile, and I did. But you know, I could also tell that his struggle was real. 
And I was struck by his awareness of where he was in his life at the end of the first quarter. And as I end a football game, there's a lot ahead of, there's a lot ahead of you at the end of the first quarter, and he, and he knew that. But he also knew that the clock was ticking. And he wasn't an undergrad anymore, with professors and his parents telling him what to do next. It was time now to make some decisions, and they were his to make. And no matter where we think we are on that arc, and of course, we really don't know. We don't have a lot of time to waste, do we? I'm reminded of a story that Anne Lamott tells about going shopping for clothes once with her friend Pam, who was undergoing cancer treatment at the time. And when Anne asked Pam if the dress she was trying on made her look fat, Pam slowly replied, Annie, I don't think you have that kind of time. Because no matter where we are on that arc, there are some things worth worrying about, and some aren't. So that's the arc. The second aspect of your life I invite you to consider are those recurring patterns the themes that you have come to recognize as part of your life story. If, for example, in casual conversation, you've heard yourself say, well, that's the story of my life, to describe the way certain things always seem to happen to you. In my case, why it is, for example, that whenever I choose a checkout line in the grocery store, I always seem to wind up in the slowest one, or, right? Or when I had a biking accident, as I did last week, why is it always my own fault when I'm within walking distance to my destination? I better figure that out before I get on my bike again. It's a part of the story of my life. And incidentally, our younger son, Patrick, like his mom, was accident-prone as a kid, to put it mildly, and some of his accidents I tr truly defied expectation, e explanation. They were so bizarre that by the time he got to high school, his friends began to refer to them as PRIs, Patrick-related incidents, which to this day, and the man is 30, to this day, what everyone refers to, what everyone in his life calls the mishaps that just seem to find him. So do you have anything like that, any pattern in your life? Are you the person who never wins at anything, or do you always win? Do you make friends easily, or does it take a long time? Would you say that you're a glass half empty kind of person? Are you a glass half full? And what would other people say about you in that way? Now, admittedly, some of these patterns are harmless, and they tend to be exaggerated. But once a pattern is ingrained and set, the story is set in our minds, it can take a, a lot of effort to change it, even if the data that supports it is suspect, or when what was once true for us isn't true anymore. And that when that begins to shift, when we begin to want to make a change in a life pattern, that's often a sign to us that change, in fact, is coming because we're tired of the old storyline. It doesn't fit us anymore. Or maybe it's the Spirit of God stirring up something new. More on that in a moment. And the third aspect now, the third and last, I invite you to consider is what you love best. What you love best about being you. What you love to do. The things that cause you to lose track of time. People who make your heart sing. The places that speak to you of home or adventure or joy. 
Another way to identify this part of yourself is to think of those things that give you a deep sense of purpose inside and that feeling of satisfaction whenever you have, have the sense that the gifts God has given you are being put to good use, even when or perhaps especially when the effort involved requires real sacrifice on your part. You may have seen the heartbreaking story of the young woman killed in Afghanistan this week. And the last picture she took was of her holding a baby, Afghan child saying, and she said something like, this is what I love to do. Your dreams show up here too. You know what you hope for, what you really want for yourself and for other people, so much that you'd, you'd give up a lot of other things for that one pearl of great price, right? So that goodness in you, that part of you that you love, that brings me now to the central word of the sermon title, gospel, gospel. It's derived from the Old English, God spell, its root meaning good story. Translated from the Latin evangelium, the Greek eungelion, where we get all of our churchy words. Good news, good news. Christians are those who have come to believe that Jesus of Nazareth was born into the world as good news of great joy for all people as we say at Christmas, and the Bible contains the four Gospels of Jesus' life, but what about the Gospel according to yours? And part of your Gospel is revealed in that innate goodness inside you, your good story, the good news you bring to others simply by being you. One of the first Christian theologians famously said that the glory of God is a human being fully alive, which is God's desire for everyone. Jesus said that he came that we might have that life and have it in abundance. But part of your life's gospel may be, quite paradoxically, where you've experienced or are experiencing now something of your vulnerability or life in its harsher terms. And the good news isn't the sorrow or the sin or the pain, but how good is somehow wrenched out of it or the ways that grace shows up for you in, the way, in times when you know you don't deserve it or when you're walking through that long, lonesome valley. And you know, I know, that even a fleeting moment of grace can carry us a long way, giving us enough, just enough, to keep going. Do you have that kind of good news story to tell, I wonder? These are your resurrection stories, perhaps not of dramatic rising from the tomb, rescue, but life rising from the ashes of something that you lost. And sometimes we don't even have that to tell. Sometimes it's just enough to allow ourselves to feel what we feel when we don't need to pretend it doesn't hurt and simply to experience receiving love when we're in pain. Now, I, I know I've posed a lot of questions before you today. I hope one, maybe two, resonated. Nothing that I've said thus far has been explicitly Christian, if you noticed, intentionally so, because what I'm attempting to describe is actually universal. What would make your story or mine explicitly or intentionally Christian is whenever we find ourselves drawn to the story of Jesus, through which we come to interpret and go deeper into the meaning of our own stories. Because for a Christian, his life becomes, in the words of a, Christian, a Christmas carol, his life becomes our life's pattern. 
His teachings inform our worldview. Jesus-related incidents become our own. Now, admittedly, this, this takes time, and it takes effort. We don't drift into this kind of spiritual path. This is the religious side of being spiritual. When we go deeper into a given path, we have to choose it. But there's a mystery involved, because more often than not, it feels to Christians, it certainly feels to me, as if he's chosen us, that the invitation to follow comes from him, or just as often from the compelling example of another person who is a Jesus follower that we are inspired by and seek to emulate. And I'm reminded here of something the late Archbishop of El Salvador, Oscar Romero, is reported to have said to his priests, the priests under his charge, your life may be the only gospel that the people will ever know. And I'm fairly certain what he meant, if in fact it was Romero who said it, is that when you're working among subsistence farmers, illiterate subsistence farmers, as many of the priests in El Salvador were, you not only preach the message of Jesus, but more importantly, you have to embody it so that those who may never be in a position to read about Jesus for themselves will nonetheless know his story because of your life. And St. Paul writes a similar exhortation in his letter to the Philippians, live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live, in other words, in such, in such a way that people will know who Jesus is because of your example. It's the vocation for any of us who want to claim the name Christian. But what I know about living the gospel, however, is that it's as much a revelation, it's a, as much a, su a surprise, a discovery to me as it is to those around me. And I don't mean this abstractly, but in the most concrete terms, because from time to time, and maybe this has happened to you, a gospel story or teaching moves from something intellectual in my mind, something, a story that I know in my mind, and becomes something else entirely. It takes up residence inside and becomes for a season the lens through which I see and understand my life, through which I experience God. It becomes the gospel of my life. And I could give you a number of examples. But to demonstrate how this process works, and I'm, I'm coming to the end here, you've been very patient. To demonstrate how this works, I'd like to just refer us all back to the gospel text that was read this morning, printed in your bulletin. Because in it, as you heard, Jesus is having an argument with a group of people referred to as the Pharisees, among the most disciplined, rigorously observant Jews of Jesus' day. And they're often his sparring partners, aren't they? He admired them for their diligence in religious practice. Jesus himself was an observant Jew, but he differed with them very sharply at times whenever he felt their outward expressions of religion did not reflect an inner humility before God and a love of neighbor, which was the essence of Torah. And like the Jewish prophets before him, Jesus hated hypocrisy in religious people people who kept up the appearances of religion while failing at its core spiritual calling. So his invitation to anyone who wants to follow him is to check out the difference between our walk and our talk, right? The invitation is to live a life of integrity. And in, there, in, in the Gospels, there are a number of incidents like this where he is calling us to pay attention to that gap between how we want others to see us and who we are. Okay. So let me end with what I began, which is an invitation. I've raised a number of questions that you might pick from as the beginning of some reflection where you are in the arc of your life. What time is it in your life? 
what you don't have time for anymore, what you love most about who you are, and where has love showed up for you when you needed it most? These are your good news stories. This is your gospel. And finally, should you hear for the hundredth or the first time Jesus inviting you into a deeper conversation with him through the stories of his life and teachings, know that it's so that his ark, his life patterns, his good news might deepen your own. And as you do that, um, you will help us all see and know something more of the love and mercy of God that uh, has been with us all along, but was waiting for us to discover it as if for the first time. May it be so, and God bless you as you live the Gospels of your lives. Amen.